What's up, everybody? Welcome into another YouTube live show tonight. I am John Kurtz. Uh, not a super heavy news week, I'll be honest with you. And, um, you know, part of that is the fact that I just did a live show on Monday. So we're, we're condensing the timeline a little bit this week. But I would say that the headlines we have got uh, this week have, have kind of pushed us further along this storyline of it's a power to world and we're all just living in it. That's basically the environment in college athletics right now. We all knew that, right? And I, I, for a while, was hesitating to even use the term power to, but I think it is almost kind of disingenuous if you're you're not going to do it right now because that is what's happening. But, man, I tell you what, if you look at the week that, like, Washington State has had, what has happened to the Cougs this week, man, it's hard not to realize just – how different this world is now and how stark the contrast is between the Big Ten and the SEC and everybody else. We can also discuss tonight the, the Pac-12 settlement, which is a little bit more positive for uh, Washington State. You know, it, just a couple of days ago, I was sitting here talking about how, hey, we, we got that. The money that is going to be flowing into Oregon State and Washington State is a little bit better than what was originally thought. So that's a positive, right? Hey, there's a nice thing for the two schools that have been left behind in all of this and have been treated as poorly as anybody in all of this. But since then, Washington State lost its basketball coach and then its athletic director in the span of basically 24 hours. And the AD went to Washington, went to their arch rival. So that is absolutely brutal for Washington State. Not to mention they lost Kyle Smith, their basketball coach, still in conference. Basically, I guess it's not. Well, what am I saying in conference? It's not in conference anymore. Uh, it's to another one of the departing schools that is going to the ACC. So you lost your basketball coach and your AD uh, to each of the traders, a couple of the traders. Anyway, uh, it's been rough. Also, uh, when it comes to the NCAA tournament, there was a really good piece that was put together by Dan Wetzel criticizing Greg Sankey, which is something that I did not take enough time to do uh, on the last show. So I do want to make sure that we get to that because Greg Sankey has been numero uno pushing uh, NCAA tournament expansion, which clearly is not something that is necessary right now. And there are some great numbers from viewership of the tournament so far to back up that opinion. But even beyond that, man, Brett Yormark, I know we've talked about it before, but he is another one of those that has really been on board with expanding the tournament in favor of more Power 5 teams getting in. And, and this plays into, I would argue, the whole theme as well, Power 2 world, and we're all living in it. I know the Big 12 is somewhat involved here. They have a little bit more pull in basketball, so it probably works there, but it's trying to skew everything toward the conferences that are left and tweak any little advantage that you can possibly get. And that is how we got into the mess that we are in right now in the current state of college athletics where nothing really makes sense and we're doing things that are going to harm the sport long term. The NCAA tournament is a glaring example of that if we are going to continue to push toward expansion there. Uh, we also even have a new rule change in college football that I think will be another thing that tilts the scale slightly in favor of the power two. How long have I been telling you guys one of the things that was really an advantage for the schools that have the extra money in the Big Ten and the SEC, one of the advantages was going to be like coaches, and they could go out and poach coaches because they don't have to fear anything when it comes to throwing money out there. They have more money to just freely toss at coaches. I think eventually, too, one thing that could come back around a little bit is facilities, um, especially as we get like five, ten years down the road of this, if nothing changes to the point where we go back to kind of a normal setup, if you have more money to throw at facilities, that's something that, you know, the non power two schools are going to be having to condense their money on and not spend anything on because they need it so many other places right now. Uh, I digress. Extra money on the coaching staff can come in handy with a new rule change that appears to be headed down the pipe in college athletics. So those are the main stories that I have today, but I also definitely would love to talk about, the coaching carousel and particularly the big 12 hires here with all the big 12 fans that we have. And that is where we're going to start because we got a contribution on Venmo that uh, I want to begin with here, but Oklahoma state search is still ongoing. West Virginia has hired a new basketball coach. Bob Huggins was trying to get into the fray at Louisville uh, before they wound up with their guy, which it appears has now happened. I guess I kind of stopped following the tweets on that earlier today. Um, 
when it was being suggested by everybody that they had their man and they were going to hire the head coach at Charleston. Um, I don't know if that ever actually totally went through or not, uh, if it's official, official from Louisville's side. But anyway, I don't think Bob Huggins is getting that job. Now, I guess I couldn't totally shut the door on Bob Huggins getting a job, but I would highly, highly doubt it anyway. Uh, it's been eventful. And Oklahoma State's coaching search was described by Matt Norlander as a, quote, mess. So we'll see what's going on with the Pokes uh, and how they're going to wind up doing here. Sounds like there's a lot of interest in the guy at Western Kentucky. But that's the basic rundown of what I have for you today on the show. If you want to be a part of the show, as always, click the dollar sign below the chat box. Attach a donation to your chat. Makes it a super chat. That is how you can get on the show Tonight, uh, if you would like the video, it's a totally free and easy way uh, to support the channel as well. I would much appreciate that. But best way, uh, click the dollar sign below the chat box in order to attach a donation, make it a super chat. You can also contribute to the channel on Venmo. Uh, it's john kurtz 4 on Venmo in order to do that if you're not catching it live. And you can still be a part of the show because if you leave a question or comment there, I will read it on the next show. And that is why we are going to start with my guy Eric today, uh, a.k.a., as he says, the Yates 27. You guys know the Yates 27 if you've been hanging out in these chats for a while. The Yates 27 says, am I wrong or did no one bring up West Virginia's new coaching hire on Monday's live show? You are not wrong, the Yates 27. Uh, nobody did bring up West Virginia's new coaching hire on Monday's live show, and I apologize for that. I think it was a very good hire by West Virginia. That's a guy that... I had looked at and said, like, look, if K-State's going to lose Jerome Tang this cycle, that is definitely something or somebody that I would have wanted to hire. Darren DeVries from Drake. Uh, I would have definitely been on board with that. So shame on everybody for not bringing that up. Okay, first of all, let me just go ahead and throw that out there for you, the H27. I will shame everybody publicly here, including myself, for not bringing up West Virginia's hire. Uh, they're also going to get DeVries' kid, it would appear, um, so that is good because he's definitely a stud to help kick things off in Morgantown there. So anyway, uh, the Yates 27 says, well, if that's the case, I'm bringing it up now. Welcome Darren DeVries to West Virginia. Let's go Mountaineers. And lastly, long live John Kurtz. Most importantly, long live John Kurtz. Thank you. The Yates 27 for that. Uh, long live the Yates 27 as well. Long live Darren DeVries, long live West Virginia. Let's spread all of the good vibes out there. Uh, it's a five-year, $15 million contract uh, for DeVries to be the, the next head coach at West Virginia. We've got details here according to uh, Keenan Cummings of WVSports.com, West Virginia rival site. Uh, DeVries is set to earn $2.8 million in his first season with his salary increasing by $100,000. Uh, through the remainder of his five-year deal. Additionally, DeVries will be eligible to earn more based on incentives for program success on and off the court. He signed his contract on March 24th. Uh, there is an extension clause activated if DeVries and the Mountaineers finish inside the top six of the conference standings in either of his first two seasons. And that would automatically extend his contract for one more year through April 30th, 2030. So he's got two cracks at it. That's an interesting way to frame that clause. Like I remember when K-State redid Chris Kleiman's contract uh, a couple of years ago, there was some controversy about the fact that if he hit eight wins, it would add an extra year onto the contract. This is a little bit more isolated, like chiseled down a little bit to basically like, look, we want you to be able to turn around the program within two years, get us back into the top. If you're in the top six of the Big 12, you're going to be in the NCAA tournament which is where West Virginia is accustomed to being and where they probably should be. Uh, so that, that seems reasonable. That seems reasonable. And that can add uh, an extra year onto the contract. Of course, DeVries, as I mentioned, has been a Drake. Uh, they were in the NCAA tournament this year. He never won less than 20 games. He won a couple of tournament titles, made a couple of NCAA tournaments uh, with Drake and he'll replace uh, Josh Eiler. So I, I think it's a, it's a good hire. I know he's a well-respected guy across the profession. Uh, if you are somebody who follows like Trilly Donovan, I kept seeing him linking again back to like, this is somebody that I would have been happy with at K-State if they were to lose Jerome Tang. Uh, like Trilly Donovan kept linking him there. Um, maybe I should be careful with that. Maybe it was more others in the Trilly 
discord i'm trying to remember specifically what that looked like but there was certainly a lot of smoke there for people that thought that was the type of program that would match up well so it makes sense here that west virginia did this and they they got their guy i mean i'm sure there was a lot of competition there there have been a lot of power five jobs that have filled up here really recently and filled up pretty fast so it feels to me like west virginia did really target him and go out and get him after i think they were waiting around in the dusty may sweepstakes there uh, along with a lot of schools there were there were a lot of people kind of getting in line on dusty may who wound up interestingly enough choosing michigan which is not what i expected so anyway uh, I hope that answers your question, the Ace 27, or, or scratches your itch, I should say, uh, to get us talking here about West Virginia's new basketball hire. We're doing it to start this show, and that is because you chimed in on Venmo. I tell you guys, you can do it. John Kurtz 4 on Venmo. You absolutely can do it and uh, get heard on the show, just like Eric. So thank you, Eric, for that. Appreciate your support of the channel. And uh, I will just toss in another reminder to uh, to like the video. If you could leave a comment in the comment section, uh, let me know what you think about this power to world that we are living in and the more power that they continue to gain as we'll transition to that here in just a moment in the show. And as always, if you want to be a part of the show live and you're listening live, you can click the dollar sign below the chat box to submit a super chat, which we'll put it in a separate column and ensure that it gets read on the show here tonight for me, control the content, make your voice heard and support the channel could not do it without all of your support and I, I genuinely do appreciate all of you guys who do support the channel in that way h Dwayne black what's up h Dwayne black thank you for being here thank you for your kind words my friend love your show john well i love your support h Dwayne black so thank you for being here and chipping in as always everybody let's let's be more like let's be more like h Dwayne black all right uh that is my guy thank you sir much appreciated uh, let's start with the Pac-12 settlement. I'll soften some of the bad news, I suppose, for Wazoo, because that is going to be a big central theme of the show today. But they got a little bit of good news with the settlement being finalized. And I suppose to them, you know, to uh, Pat Chun, who just left as the athletic director, um, maybe it's news that he already knew. Maybe it's news that Kirk Schultz already knew. Um. But uh, either way, the details have been finalized now. So Oregon State and Washington State have finalized a settlement over financial distributions with the 10 schools leaving the Pac-12. The departing schools will have $5 million withheld during the 2024 fiscal year for a total of $50 million under the deal announced Monday. The departing schools also will each pay a $1.5 million supplemental contribution to the conference that will be used by the remaining schools to navigate an uncertain future. Uh, so it, it all totals about $65 million here with the supplemental contribution that is going to be used to um, – that will be used as a part of handling some of the liabilities that the conference has, which are the lawsuits that are out there, Holiday Bowl. I'm trying to remember what all there was. There were like two or three of them that came in pretty rapid speed at the Pac-12 over the last year. Of course, the the biggest lawsuit is the House lawsuit in the NCAA, and all the schools are going to be on the hook, it sounds like, for millions of dollars in basically NIL back payments uh, as a part of an antitrust um, or a class action, rather, suit there. So uh, that is what that is for. And then the $5 million withheld is something that had also been rumored for a long time that it would be something like that. They're just not going to get the full allotment of revenue on their way out the door. Uh, departing members will also not, this is one of the, the parts that I, I'm not sure that I saw a lot of this speculated about beforehand, but the departing members will not be entitled to any revenue generated after this year and will have no vote direction, input or other power with the conference's use allocation of this expenditure, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's not so much the voting part. I'm quite certain that I always would have thought they would not have voting powers on their way out the door like this, but to not have any of the future revenue generated, that, that is a big win. That's a big win for Wazoo and Oregon State. They definitely wanted to be able to have access to that money. Like the NCAA tournament money doesn't pay out for, for six years. You get it over time. It's a little complicated how all that works, but people talk about the units where you get like $2 million units for teams advancing in the NCAA tournament. That means that every time the Pac-12 wins a game right now in the NCAA tournament, it's going to come back to Washington State and Oregon State, which, which is definitely a good thing. Um, now, the article points out the settlement was agreed to in principle late last year. So that's what I mean, where these details are probably already known. 
Uh, quote, this is a quote from the 10 schools that are leaving. So here's schools that are having to cough up the money. Quote, we are pleased to finalize an agreement with Oregon State and Washington State that provides support for all our student athletes while ensuring an equal distribution of the vast majority of funds earned by all 12 schools during the 23-24 academic year. Uh, under this agreement, our schools will have the right to vote on matters that will affect all 12 schools this year, while Oregon State and Washington State will have control over future conference revenue and decisions. Um, article goes on to say, um, uh, on paper, that's a $65 million concession to Oregon State and Washington State, which were left behind um, when the rest of the conference chose to depart for other leagues. In reality, the two schools will see a lot more than that because they'll also keep the bulk of future Pac-12 revenue. The agreement states that outside of future income that was supposed to be paid prior to the 10 teams leaving this summer, all future Pac-12 revenue will stay with the conference. It's building the war chest. I know we've, we've talked at times about building the war chest. People love using that that term for what this was. This is building up the war chest as much as you can for Washington State and Oregon State and in light of what is happening. So you feel good for them on that front. But at the same time, the situation is still pretty bleak. And it's it's just such a crazy contrast of the world that we are living in and the one that is even below where the Big 12 and the ACC are that Washington State and Oregon State are living in, what has happened to Wazoo over the last couple of days. But before we do get to that, we'll throw in this part. Um, included in this money, the tens of millions of dollars that the Pac-12 will be paid in the next six years for success in previous NCAA tournaments. Uh, the NCAA rewards teams for their tournament success in a complex way called units, which pay out for six subsequent years. As a very rough proxy, each game played by a Pac-12 team in the tournament is eventually worth about $2 million over the course of those six years. And the Pac-12 is still yet to be fully paid for dozens of those units. Uh, points out that means Arizona's run to the Sweet 16 and units earned by Colorado and Oregon will all stay with the conference so there's a brief rundown if you want a little bit more in depth in terms of thoughts on that details on all of that there was a video that i put out earlier this week that you can check out about that 65 million dollars that will be coming to washington state and oregon state but very quickly the harsh reality of the situation that wazoo is in came at them really fast life comes at you fast as they say and um Wazoo lost a great basketball coach and Kyle Smith who went to Stanford. And then 24 hours later, the one that has to sting even more, they, they lose their athletic director to Washington <laughs> to their arch rival, man. That, that is as brutal as it gets. I mean, put yourself, whoever you're a fan of, put yourself in those shoes. You're losing your athletic director to your rival immediately after losing your basketball coach, to another team that used to be in your conference, but is now leaving. Um, this is an AD who had been outspoken. Uh, Pat Chun, um, Chun, I'm guessing, I think I said Chun earlier. I, I'm going to go Chun. I should have looked this up before I came on. Folks, this is why I used to be a big J journo, professional. Now I'm just a YouTuber. Uh, I have lost my professional touch with things like that. But, you know, Chun had been a guy who had taken some some shots, some not so veiled shots at Washington in the media before and i'm going to get to an article in the seattle times that kind of pointed that out and then the realities of this world in college athletics just came back around the reality was like he can't not take this job it is so much better for your career to be at washington than it is to be at washington state like there's just not much way around that and he's also chun an ohio state guy like an ohio state protege who did not get the Ohio State job. Honestly, if I were Ohio State, I would have given it to him before I would have Ross Bjork from Texas A&M, but wasn't my decision to make. He didn't get that. So he's looking at this like, I can be an AD in the Big Ten if I ever want to be at Ohio State, if that really is his dream job. There's a much better way to get there by being at a school that's actually in that league instead of at Washington State. That may be a part of the reality right now. Like Washington State had fallen to the point where Ohio State looked at that and said, nah, we can't do that. That's that's not even technically a like a a power five athletic director anymore. And so the reality of the situation is you can lose your athletic director who has been kind of speaking on your behalf, puffing out his chest a little bit at the reality of what happened with the Pac-12 and Washington's role in all of that. He can turn around and then just dump you 
and leave for that same person because they have the money and power right now. That's the money and power dynamic in college athletics. It sucks. It sucks. I, I'm, I hated this story. And I know some people question my sincerity when I say that, like, I really feel bad for Washington state and Oregon state. I sincerely do. And I think this is just like one of the grosser stories of the current state of college athletics and how it is right now, man. I hated to see this. I don't, I don't know how anybody other than Washington fans could have really enjoyed seeing that at all. Like even the way that it was written by like John Wilner in his article, he kind of stopped in the middle of it and just said like, oof, wazoo. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like that in the middle of the article. And it's because nobody can really watch this unfold and, and not feel bad, not have that kind of be a gut punch to everybody involved. It's, it's not what anybody wants to see right now, but unfortunately that's where we're at. So the other part of the the harsh reality of this for Washington state is that now they they've got to hire a basketball coach and look, it can be done because Washington just did it without an athletic director, but it's, it's certainly not as easy. And that's probably the first thing that you have to do as opposed to, you know, what's going to be a, at least my perception is a more intensive and more difficult search for an athletic director than it would be to hire a basketball coach, but you got to get somebody in there before guys start transferring. Like so it's not just the the big picture, the macro of what has happened here and losing your AD and basketball coach, but the micro is a pretty disturbing reality too, because this is a time where the portals running wild. And if, if you don't get some semblance of order in there and a guy who's just going to be able to run the basketball program, you know, who are you going to have playing? Like the, the whole roster will be in the portal. So the, I can't imagine being at watch Kirk Schultz, for instance, right now, or just, the deputy ADs at Washington state, the people that are going to have to deal with this right now, the timing is, is not good at all. And that's another problem that we kind of have in college athletics right now, right? Just the timing on all this stuff. There's so much craziness going on with NIL and the portal. None of it is timed very well. A lot of complaints about the timing of the portal being open around the NCAA tournament uh, signing day in football has been a popular topic here recently. Like none of the timing works out well for like anybody's sanity basically. And it makes it even worse when you're losing things like an athletic director and a basketball coach here. So anyway, I thought this article from Matt Calkins of the, the Seattle times was pretty appropriate here about uh, Chun leaving Washington state. He says, there's that old saying about actions versus words and Washington's hiring of uh, Pat Chun epitomizes it. it. Wasn't long ago that then Washington state athletic director was jabbing the Huskies. Now he's joining them. Uh, a couple of recent examples during an interview on KJR FM a few months back, Chun said that next season's Big Ten football champion would not come from the Pacific Northwest, uh, which obviously is a, a jab at Washington and Oregon, who left saying, like, look, you, you're, you're not going to win the Big Ten. Well, now he's taking over one of those schools. So um, I don't know if he's going to walk that comment back or how exactly that's going to work. I wouldn't bet on Washington to win the big 10 either. I think it's a, a fair point. Oregon might have a shot, but it's interesting. He gets hired in light of that, but that, that shows just how good of an AD he has actually been. Uh, the other quote that the article points out says in response to a question about the rivalry between Washington state and Washington going forward, uh, Chun said the majority of Cougs have a very defined opinion of what a Husky is. And I'm guessing that for many of them, what happened in the summertime reaffirmed how they feel about the Huskies. I guess he's creating like a, a level of separation between himself and the fan base there, putting it more like in third person. Like it's it's not him, right? It's the fans. Look, it's not me that has this opinion of what Washington is. It's our fans. This is what Washington State fans think that a Husky is, but they damn sure have confirmed their preconceived notions on that based on the fact that they just left them high and dry this summer. Um, the article here says those weren't scorched earth comments. And you could argue the quote about uh, above is Chun articulating what fans feel as I just did. Uh, but it was clear. Chun was ticked about conference realignment and Washington's role in it. <laughs> Doesn't matter now though, to paraphrase Marshawn Lynch. It's just about that action boss. And yeah, uh, actions do speak louder than words here. He's gone. He left and he went to Washington. Um, here's what the article points out is the accomplishments here. I mean, basically he's being painted and I read Wilner too. Wilner just gushed uh, about Pat Chun as an athletic director, not just the stability that he's provided through really tough times at, at Washington state going through the PAC 12 breakup, but also just his, 
track record of hiring and the job that he's done at fundraising. We hired Kyle Smith as Washington State's men's basketball coach. Obviously, that worked out well. 11 years uh, since they had last made the NCAA tournament. It had been eight years since they managed a winning record, and uh, Kyle Smith changed all of that, won 22 games a couple of years ago, and got to the second round of the NCAA tournament this year. They were ranked as high as 18th in the country at one point in time. Uh, his hire in women's basketball, Cami Etheridge, uh, 28 years since they had made the NCAA tournament when she was hired. She went to the tournament three consecutive years from 2021 to 2023, uh, won a Pac-12 conference tournament in there. And then as far as fundraising goes, uh, from 2014 to 2018, he raised $11.5 million annually, which was nearly tripling the athletic department's fundraising efforts um, while he was there. They averaged more than uh, 30. Oh, okay. So it was, it went from 11.5 million to 31 million uh, with Chun as the athletic director. So there's your tripling. Um, he also helped negotiate a settlement in the wake of the Pac 12 fallout that netted uh, Washington State and Oregon State about 250 million over the next 10 years. Uh, so in conclusion, here it says money management and hiring. That's basically what being a good AD comes down to. Uh, granted, between new football coach Jed Fish and new men's basketball coach Danny Sprinkle, the Huskies are set with their head coaches in the revenue sports, but they are also navigating a dicey financial situation. That is a piece of this. It's not exactly a pristine financial situation in the short term that Chun will be walking into. Um, the athletic department continues to operate in a multi-million dollar deficit. Uh, we talked about that here over the last year or so on the channel that both Washington and Washington State were having some budget issues. Uh, and the university continues to pay off a loan for Husky Stadium's 2020, uh, 2012 renovation to the tune of over $17 million a year. And then, obviously, they're joining the Big Ten at a reduced cut, right? They're not going to get a full cut of the TV revenue as they uh, as they enter the conference. So, um, anyway, the final statement here, no doubt that Chun can run his mouth sometimes. That's okay, because what Washington saw is that he can run an athletic department. That's a sad truth, man. He's... I say sad from Washington state standpoint, obviously Washington, that's fine. Like whatever they can, no one is shedding a tear that there were some comments made by Chun that could be disparaging, taken as disparaging toward Washington. And now he's going to go have to walk in there. No one's going to feel bad for anyone on that side of it. It's the Washington state part of it, obviously where this, where this is sad because he was so good at what he did and he was right there, right under Washington's nose. Washington has the ability to make up for a mistake with their athletic director who lasted less than a year before jumping off to Nebraska, they have the the ability to write a mistake by just raiding their rival. I mean, it's just ultimate ultimate college athletics hierarchy right now. And uh, just, I can't imagine how gut wrenching that is to be a Washington state fan right now and have, have to deal with it. Here was what John Wilner said. Wilner said for Washington state. And then he interjects, Oh, Cougs. Uh, the Chun move comes one day after basketball coach Kyle Smith left for Stanford, but it's a far more significant loss. Uh, Chun's stewardship of Cougar athletics was the one constant through the tumult that began August 4th when the PAC 12 collapsed. Um, and you remember Washington's central role in the affair. The Huskies declined an all in deal with Apple and in the pre-dawn hours of August 4th opted to enter the big 10 along with Oregon. The resulting implosion eventually left Washington state and Oregon state alone. Well, the two schools just finalized a settlement with the 10 outgoing members. Uh, their futures are anything but secure. The Huskies use their elevated status to lure Chun away and leave the Cougars scrambling once again, just eight months after delivering the hammer. The hammer there being destroying the conference. Uh, the one saving grace for WSU, Chun will have immense empathy for the Cougars, and we suspect will make every attempt to help the Cougars with interstate scheduling and any other matter related to their survival and prosperity. I mean... I guess that is true. I was about to say, I mean, who cares if I were a Washington State fan? I'd probably just throw the middle finger up at that. Like, you know, I don't care, whatever. But that actually might be something that would legitimately help them a little bit in the position that they're in right now. So maybe I shouldn't thumb my nose at that too much because you kind of have to do anything and everything that you can to get by and survive right now. And that will be something that can help a bit. Um, it's just still... A hard one to swallow in stomach like i would you would you rather have to deal with the taunting from your rival there that man we can just go pluck your ad like that and and keep on moving after we destroyed the conference and ruined all your relevancy in the the college athletics world 
at the expense of being able to say, at least we kind of have an ally in that athletic department that'll help us out a little bit. Um, I don't know. In practical terms, it is probably better for them, but in uh, at least certainly in Twitter terms where we live in like a Twitter world where everyone's waiting to get off their, their 140, what is it? 140, 160, however many characters uh, to pop off at you and make fun of you. Uh, it's, it's brutal. It is a brutal, brutal break for them. All right. Uh, Alpha cat. What's up? Alpha cat. Alpha cat. Appreciate uh, your support of the channel. Alpha cat says, wait, Kirk, Holt, Kirk Schultz can hire John Curry again, man. How about that? Yes. Kirk Schultz wants the, president at k state now of course the president at washington state um will be tasked in large part with making this kind of hire john curry's now at wake forest i don't know that's the problem though wake forest is not power two it's the next level down being in the acc right and a lower level acc school at that but they still that's still a pretty significant edge over washington state like that you know I didn't even discuss the part of this where now Washington state has to go hire somebody else in the climate and the context of yeah, not only are they not in a power four conference, but how do you manage the financial waters here and how you, how do you manage scheduling, having your non-revenue sports in the West coast conference, and then having to schedule out for football for a couple of years, still managing what's going to, whatever the merger, if you want to call it that, what it's going to look like with, the mountain West and how that will go down. It's a pretty unprecedented thing to be taking on for anybody. And I know that everybody in college athletics right now is dealing with unprecedented times to a certain extent, but that is even a little bit more so than just your average person in college athletics. So it's, it's going to take a unique individual uh, to want to take on that job. And probably I would think limit you much more to, young up and comers like somebody who may not be an athletic director right now that wants their shot and and wants this to be their chance to uh uh really stake their claim as as to what they can do as as an athletic director that's that's a part of the issue here you have a more limited pool of candidates so anyway alpha cat appreciate that hey maybe if they get the band back together that would make some sense i mean it does feel like the situation at K-State with uh, Jerome Tang and Richard Linton, the president there, is very similar to what John Curry and Frank Martin was once upon a time. Uh, so I'm getting like deja vu flashbacks about that with uh, leadership trying to run off a coach. That's what it felt like John Curry definitely did to Frank Martin once upon a time. Kirk Schultz was certainly a part of that too. So I, I guess you might as well get the band back together, right? Uh, everything is is a little bit too similar in that regard right now. Uh, anyway, if you want to be like Alpha Cat and join the show, you can click the dollar sign below the chat box to attach a donation to your chat, make it a super chat, which will allow you to control the content on the show, make your voice be heard, and support the work that I'm doing to bring you Big 12, conference realignment, college football, college basketball content here on this channel. And please do like the video. It is totally free, uh, easy way to support the channel as well. Just one click. And if you could leave a comment in the comment section, that really helps as well. Are you feeling bad for the Cougs? Let's get some sympathy going for the Cougs, please, in the comments. Uh, I would I would very much appreciate it if you did that. Um, if you want more on the Pac-12, again, I did a video earlier this week that you can check out about the settlement. Okay, so NCAA tournament. NCAA tournament ratings were, according to CBS, as high as ever. You know, those can be fudged a little bit. Um, as somebody who has some experience now in PR, PR people are very good at working the angles there to make that stand out. But bottom line is the the ratings have been excellent for the NCAA tournament in spite of everybody complaining about NIL, the portal, all this discussion about we need to expand the tournament from guys like Greg Sankey and unfortunately guys like Brett Yormark as well. Um, yet the tournament seems to be doing just fine. The conversation around this and the fact that we have the Greg Sankeys of the world really leading the charge and pushing for, we need to get more barely over 500 power five basketball teams in the NCAA tournament. I thought Dan Wetzel nailed it on the head when he wrote that it's it's basically the whole problem that we have with the sport right now that, well, college athletics, not the sport. It goes beyond that with college athletics right now is that you have everything is just a short term money grab and power grab. Everybody is having to cling to every single little thing that they can right now. So I want to, 
I wanted to read you some of this because I felt like it fit the theme overall tonight of again, power to world. Everybody's just sort of powerless to do anything but live in it and uh, allow the power to to do essentially what they want to here. But the the TV numbers specifically are CBS claims that Thursday was the most watched Thursday since 2015. Um, and it was the most watched Friday ever with 8.3 million people. They also said it was the most watched Saturday ever, which was 10.3 million, which would make the first three days uh, the most watched ever at uh, 9 million. Um, but Wessel says, regardless of whether records are truly being set uh, here in a an era of fractured viewership and rare shared experiences, it's abundantly clear that the NCAA tournament is not just healthy, but thriving against industry trends. Uh, Sports Business Journal, meanwhile, reported the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament sold at least 97% of its tickets. So not just doing well on TV, it's doing well in person. It is still a draw. Uh, people still want to go in person. Wetzel went into a little bit more of like the minutia of the, the specific sport, not just like, hey, everyone's dealing with the portal and NIL, which turns some people off. But he also said, there's no top draft pick, future NBA stars, a la Zion Williamson, and it, it still doesn't matter. Uh, he says a new player procurement system where NIL and the transfer portal are spreading talent around and Nike and Adidas uh, no longer just stock the rosters of their preferred historically dominant brands. Maybe not fun for a few established schools, but even better for everybody else. A bracket that is held firm at 68, meaning there aren't 18 and four more 18 and 14 teams from campuses with 80,000 seat football stadiums. Uh, turns out the event soldiered on without them. College basketball is fine, better than fine. Well, it's hard to argue, at least with the part about the NCAA tournament. I mean, I, I would still say college basketball as a whole. I mean, I followed stuff outside of my conference and my team a lot more 15, 20 years ago when I was growing up. There are a number of reasons why, but I think it is very clear that it is a it, less of a national sport during the regular season. But March Madness, which is where all the money is made by the NCAA, their biggest moneymaker, period, throughout the year, everything there is doing just fine. The NCAA tournament is just fine, and that's what really, truly matters in the sport. It is very hard to argue that. And so here's where Wetzel starts going in on, on the Sankeys of the world. He says, so maybe... If you were one of the people who are paid millions to run college athletics, you'd be thankful to be in the position you are. Maybe you'd consider it a blessing that you can serve as a steward for this magical event, a uniquely American creation that has captured America's attention for generations. Maybe you'd see those TV numbers, see the social media frenzies, smile at the upsets and upstarts, uh, see the young fans in the stands form the same relationship with this event as so many have before. And you would promise to protect it at all costs for the good of it all, and the good of all. And of course, we know that's not what anybody is doing here because we could all certainly argue college football very much in the same vein. Like college football is a wonderful thing that so many people have bonded with before, so many people can bond with again and keep that, but yet we insist on destroying the sport at virtually every turn. So why should we expect it to really be any different in, in college basketball? That is That is the unfortunate reality here. So Wetzel says... Or you could continue to push for expansion, including floating out the need for reviews on issues such as giving away highly competitive opportunities for automatic qualifiers from smaller leagues. You know, like Oakland and Yale. Oakland and Yale, uh, who had first round upsets, Oakland beating Kentucky and turning into the darling of the first round of the tournament, and the SEC being on the receiving end of a lot of this. And Greg Zanke did take a lot of crap for it. It was not great timing for him for once. Something came back on Greg Sankey, which was nice to see, right? You realize the guy's not just completely Teflon. He took some shots for his comments that occurred right before the tournament and then what happened to his league in it. But the problem is, like, will it will it even matter? Um, because as Wetzel explains here, talk to anyone in college sports, and they say expansion to at least 72 teams is coming. SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey has become the face of this, but he is hardly alone. Uh, these days, college athletics is about seizing any small advantage for a single conference or school. One more bit of revenue, one more slot in the tournament, one more advantage in seeding. Uh, meanwhile, the general welfare is too often ignored. Concern for messing with the formula too much isn't considered. Not even here in a march where the athletes are reminding us what this is all about and the fans are voting with their attention and viewership. 
I mean, that is such a well-written two paragraph stanza there because it is, it is all about short-term money grabs. What have we argued about the potential long-term problems here of conference realignment? And especially if it goes to a super league thing in college football, the argument has been like, you're going to, you're going to turn off people. It's not going to be what it used to be. And so many people will stop caring about it because their team doesn't matter the way that it used to. You risk long-term just ruining this thing and it won't be worth nearly as much money to anybody then. So you're going to get not only diminishing returns, but potentially plummeting returns at some point. Nobody thinks about it. Nobody cares about it because right now Fox and ESPN have seen, well, we can just make more money by having Ohio state playing Washington or USC every single week on big noon Saturday, big noon kickoff. Like that's what we want. And nobody cares or thinks beyond that. There is no foresight and there is, most importantly, no real governing body with the power to stop it. We don't have like a commissioner of college football looking out for the good of everything. And so now that leads to here. Greg Sankey knows he has all the power. We just saw him try to flex that power to get automatic buys in a 14 team college football playoff for his league. Now he tries to flex that power on the NCAA tournament. Like, I want to get more teams from my league in not just to have more shots, I guess, theoretically at the title. It's more about like money, right? We, I mentioned the units earlier when, when talking about the PAC 12, you get the units, the $2 million units for wins in the tournament. If we get more teams in, we get more of our teams in who cares if it comes at the expense of automatic qualifiers from Cinderella type conferences. If we get more of our teams in, we'll win more games. We'll get more units. We'll get more money. And the beat goes on. And it's just the way that the the football system has been rigged. You're going for the same type of thing. Now, it's only fair of me to mention that Brett Yormark has also been somebody that has been a proponent of expansion for the NCAA tournament because he looks at it and says it's it's the same idea as like Tony Petiti when he was bringing up 14 team college football playoff seemingly before anybody. It was one of the first that we heard like publicly he was someone pushing for it. He said, "Look at my league. I've got more teams than anybody." So I've got all these big brands. I want more spots in there because I've got more teams. I can take advantage of this better than anybody else out there. Well, Brett Yormark says, look, you guys have commandeered football. You guys have taken away all the advantages on the football side. What I have is the best basketball conference in the country. And what I have is a league that if the bubble expanded could probably get another team or two in there every single year consistently and therefore get us more money, have our teams taking up more time on TV more eyeballs, and that could be an advantage for our league. And I'm, I, I definitely have to say, I get kind of caught in the middle of that because on the one hand, I'm saying it is stupid the way that all this is going right now. It is, it is very stupid, the current state of everything. But, and, and I don't want them to expand the tournament. There's no reason to, absolutely no reason to. But at the same time, you got to fight this. If you're not going to fight dirty, the way that the SEC and Big Ten are fighting right now, you're going to get left even further behind. So you're kind of drawn into the mud by the way that they have been doing this and leveraging the system. You have to try and leverage the system best that you can. And for the big 12, that is maximizing basketball. So like your Mark's hand has kind of been forced into that. So as much as I hate it from a big picture perspective, you sort of have to be hypocritical and do what you can to take advantage of the advantages that you have. So it, it puts you in a catch 22. It puts you in a situation where, yes, I understand it is hypocritical, um, and I have to, I, I guess you could say call Brett Yormark out on it, but at the same time, it's, it's a very empathetic calling out because I completely understand what he's doing. I completely understand why he's doing it. He has to, he has to, man, he absolutely has to, but it's just a, it's just a really crappy example of where the sport is at. I mean, I kind of look at it like I do politics right now and I know don't, don't freak out too much here, but it's like one side does something that's kind of low blow below the belt, not something you would want to do. And the other side feels like they've got to match it because if we don't, the other side is just going to continue to do it. And you got both sides kind of looking at each other that way. And that's how you get to a situation where everything sucks. And um, there are no decisions being made really for the greater good of everybody. We're in that same state right now with college athletics, which is, which is not a good place to be. Uh, not a good place to be at all. So I, I appreciate Wetzel for writing it up that way. And that really struck a chord with me when I thought like, man, look at how all this is going down right now. And uh, 
look how much that just fits this central theme of where everything is going in the sport. And I've got one more thing I'm going to add to that, which is about a new rule that seems to be coming with, uh, with coaches in college football. But I do want to check in with uh, Browns and beers, Browns and beers. I appreciate you being here tonight. Always love seeing you uh, here on the channel. We've got a lot of West Virginia support tonight. So uh, that's good. Browns and beers and the West Virginia fans happy about their new basketball coach. He says, uh, the more I've read into uh, DeVries, the more I've liked him, which is always a great sign for a hire. Uh, fair warning, still saw some Cards fans saying they should go after Tang. Well, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of speculation about that. I mean, Trilly Donovan has been trying to send Jerome Tang to Louisville for like a year and a half at this point, um, but does not look like that's going to be the case. Everything earlier today was, is it, is it Pat Kelsey? Yeah, it's Pat Kelsey at uh, Charleston. Uh, the Courier Journal, yeah, it's like everywhere now. So Pat Kelsey to be named next men's basketball coach. He's going to be the guy at Louisville. Um, you know, I, I got to be honest. I think he's another guy that could be successful, but based on the names that they were fishing in, thinking that they could get Scott Drew, uh, I guess I should say like the waters they were fishing in, the names they were chasing. That's a pretty underwhelming hire for sure. Just from a name value standpoint, doesn't mean that the guy can't coach or be great, but it's it's not going to win the press conference the way. A lot of the rumored names were there for a while. Uh, but yes, Jerome Tang was being thrown out there a lot for that job. Never seemed to really materialize very much. Um, whether that was on the Louisville end or his end, I, I, I guess we'll we'll never know probably. But um, I mean, I'm certainly happy that it didn't happen. It just became very clear. I mean, they got really low down on their list and had to reset a couple times on what they were doing and you never saw from like the serious insiders, Jerome Tang's name coming up a lot as like a really serious candidate. So for that reason, I was never over the last few days, supremely worried about that job specifically, the rest of the carousel. I mean, you know, that still definitely has me nervous and I think you're going to have to sweat it out a little bit if you are a K-State fan, but yeah, not going to have to worry about it for, uh, for Louisville. I mean, they like Richard Patino was in there all of a sudden at one point, and then it was like, well, Richard Patino is out. And you're like, man, if they're getting down to that, boy. Um, shirts at Indiana State. That was another name that was coming up that may have actually had the opportunity to take the job, but decided not to. Anyway, I know Browns and Beers, you care more about uh, DeVries. Um, like I said, I, I like the guy. The more I started to look into him, the more I was very much uh, warmed up to that. I, I think my question there will be, what is he going to look like with the N this should help obviously the NIL that West Virginia can provide him with, because I, I don't think that will be too much of a problem at West Virginia, but it was going to be like, you know, what does he look like recruiting with a full NIL budget? I mean, I think the guy clearly can coach basketball. And then I kind of stop myself and it's like, I don't know when you evaluate it now, how much of it is what we traditionally think of as being a quote unquote good recruiter and how much of it is just having a good enough collective, you know, I, that's a discussion I would actually love to have with a, uh, a basketball coach like somebody who's on a staff right now what is the the breakdown of skill set with that right now how much does it matter like is it being the ability to be a good quote-unquote recruiter is that being neutralized right now just because of the money of it i'd be very interested to know but my, that's kind of like my gut if i were thinking in more of a traditional sense would wonder about a guy coming up from that level at drake but i think it's clear that he's a good basketball coach and and honestly like the fact that he's got his son coming with him is a really nice way to try and jumpstart things in, in year one too. So glad that you're happy Browns and beers uh, wish nothing but the best for you guys, because I know times have been a uh, little bit rough. You guys have had to endure a lot, a lot between the NCAA rulings and everything that happened with Huggins and that falling apart, like and to deal with a lot with the West Virginia basketball program. So appreciate you Browns and beers. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Aloha Nate 2004. What's up Aloha Nate 2004. Aloha Nate 2004 expand to 128 teams at a weekend. Would CBS pay for it? If not, why expand? Yeah, well, sir. I mean, yes, it would definitely be all about money. Now, a part of this is to, yeah, wanting to get extra teams in there to get extra units and make your money that way. If someone's going to pay for it, there's always going to be somebody in college athletics pushing for it to expand. I read your comment at first and I was like, man, is this really going to be someone saying like, why not expand? Because to me, it's like, well, I, I done 128 teams, like just devalues the accomplishment of it. You know, I don't really, that's basically think about like 
just watching a bunch of NIT games under the the umbrella of the NCAA tournament, but not even to the round of 64 yet. Like it just, those are not teams that are going to be good enough to make truly deep runs. I know we don't, we don't need that. I know like that number had been thrown out there at one point. I don't, we, I don't think anybody really needs that. I would, they pay for it. I don't know. I would say like, I would highly doubt anyone pays for it, but I guess if they're looking at the ratings from this weekend, um or yeah this past weekend that maybe they would say hey there's an appetite for it i don't know i certainly don't want it and if if cbs isn't going to pay for it then yeah i mean i'm with you if not why expand you definitely wouldn't expand if nobody is going to pay for it but i think that's that's definitely the idea that there would be uh that there would be some money in it so anyway aloha nate appreciate you being here great to see you uh on the channel tonight and thank you for your support uh it is definitely buzzer beater time people if you want to get one in i'll uh do just a couple more minutes here because i've got this last story about coaching change uh well coaching rules changes happening in uh in college athletics got to be very careful about how i frame that uh but you can click the dollar sign below the chat box to submit a donation and be on the show tonight here within the last couple of minutes if you have something also if you could like the video we really appreciate that really free easy way uh, to support the channel. So this is another thing I felt like I was reading this. I got pretty far deep into this Ross Dellinger article about a change from the NCAA football oversight committee. And I thought this feels like another thing that can be leveraged by the power to with their extra money. And eventually he did get to that and point to like, Hey, critics might say this is something that could happen, but there was a big 12 coach, Neil Brown, speaking of West Virginia, Neil Brown was quoted in this story as being in favor of this rule. And it does sound like a lot of coaches are. So here it is. Uh, the NCAA football oversight committee introduced a legislative proposal this month that would expand the abilities of a football support staff. So it would permit all staff members to give players skill and tactical coaching instruction, uh, both during practice and games. The proposal introduced for a second straight year after failing to get approval last spring eliminates the policy limiting coaching instruction to only the NCAA's maximum of 11 countable coaches. Okay, basically what this does is it allows all your your, your analysts, uh, support staff, those guys would get to actually coach. Right now, they're not supposed to. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen sometimes perhaps often at a lot of schools but they are technically not supposed to be able to actually go out and coach on the practice field or on the game field this would give them the opportunity to do that and on one hand i can understand why everyone would say like yeah well of course like that makes sense that's a really hard thing to enforce when are these guys coaching when are they not coaching are they just looking at film are they helping with certain aspects of recruiting like what are they actually doing um I can see why you'd say, well, that kind of makes sense. Take some stress off of people and how you're going to actually enforce this. Uh, the proposal, by the way, is in a six week socialization stage. Members of the oversight committee will get feedback from their respective conferences. Uh, they'll come back in mid-May to uh, assess feedback and potentially adopt the legislation. So it's, it's certainly being considered right now. Um, but my thought with this is I was like, this will be something that Big schools in the Big Ten and SEC will leverage. They're going to have more money. We're talking about the difference of 40, 50, 60 million extra dollars a year. That can easily go to more support staff. And you can so you could basically you can hire essentially as many coaches as you want. Now, at a certain point, is it diminishing returns and you wouldn't want too many coaches out there? Yes, I'm sure that would be true for most coaches. But um still you can maximize. You can figure out where that point is, get it all the way up to that level and maximize what you have. You can also be splitting more responsibilities now if you really wanted to right if you're going to have a position coach do more recruiting and you want to have somebody take over some of the on-field stuff for them you have like an assistant quarterbacks coach you can have one of the quarterbacks coaches be skewed much more toward recruiting the other one toward now i can actually go out there and be on the field and coach like you can siphon off some responsibilities that way i think there there are a lot of creative ways that schools with more money could figure out how to do that that's a concern for me with this at least maybe i'm not being someone who's actually in these rooms and on a staff maybe i'm being a little bit too paranoid about that because here's a quote from neil brown at west virginia that says uh quote it really takes all the gray area out of what each role can do and uh, cannot do there's a little gray area in some leagues and some compliance departments look at it differently than others I think it's really good for the profession. Our job as coaches is to grow and develop those on your staff. 
So Neil Brown doesn't seem to have a problem with it. Uh, I don't know if that works to let your guard down, but uh, it, it doesn't do a ton for me. I kind of think like Neil, like, I don't know, man, that, that may actually be worse for you because your peers may be getting one over on you. Um, where was the part where Dellinger actually addressed this one second here? Yeah, here you go. The change could be viewed as yet another way that more well-resourced programs will separate themselves, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to stockpile coaches. Many expect the move will trigger more coaching movement from the group of five to power four. That's another thing. It sucks for, you know, we talk about this from the perspective of Big 12 and ACC versus Big 10 and SEC. But yeah, I would think this will definitely pull more coaches from group of five FCS up to the power four level because they'll just have more room on their staff for coaches that can do things. Uh, you know, you, if you were taking one of those analyst positions before it would cut back, you're going to lose your ability to grow and develop as a coach on the field. No more. Now you can do it. So there's more reason to be, to be making that jump. Um, I would just say, keep an eye on this. It feels to me most of the, at least the tone of this article, the quotes that we see here, there were a lot of quotes from Craig bull, who was the former, uh, North Dakota state head coach who's now in charge of a lot of this stuff on the NCAA football oversight committee. Um, it just feels like the sentiment right now is that people generally are for this uh, within the profession enough. So I'd imagine that that probably is going to pass. Is it a huge, huge thing? No, it's probably not a huge, huge thing, but it's another way. It's another way. What did Dan Wetzel say? You find every single way that you can grab it, money and power and, continue your grip over the sport. It's another way for them to do that. Maybe a smaller way, but another way in general um, and falls in line with what my fear had always been about. Look, if you have more money, you can throw more money at the coaches, pull coaches away from this league. Maybe some of that will work the same way too. You would lose more assistance on your staff because they could be pulled away by people who could pay them more and you'd still be able to coach on field at uh, at the power two level. I would not imagine this is a major, major impact, but emblematic, I think, of where we're at and another just advantage that is that is not needed, not needed by uh, all those folks who already have all the advantages. All right, Alpha Cat. Alpha Cat looks like we'll close us off today. Appreciate you, Alpha Cat. Says, I do feel for Wazoo. Uh, if the Big Ten had rated the pack before the SEC rated the Big 12, uh, K-State might be in the same boat. 100%. 100%. Again, question the sincerity, if you will, but I very much understand where my school is at, and I very much understand how Washington State was in a similar position, and uh, poor leadership within their conference put them right here, but it very easily could have been my school as well. So that is that is also another part of it, man. It's also another part of it. I, I feel brutally bad for wazoo and i'm glad alpha cat is is there with me so at least there's a couple of us uh in the chat today and let me know in the comments the comment section of the video if uh if you're right there with us or not so thank you alpha cat uh for your support of the channel and for being here tonight appreciate all of you guys hopping on a little bit earlier than than normal with me uh tonight on uh you know fairly slow news week see if anything big happens i know that um if you pay attention to peek around the corner, Greg Flugar, he is forecasted, I believe it's tomorrow that is a potentially big day at North Carolina where you would have, um, is it the president of the board that's speaking? Um, I'm just going to look at this. The chair of the board getting a chance to speak about conference realignment potentially at their board of trustees meeting. Uh, so it could be, be a very interesting day on the North Carolina front tomorrow. As always, stay tuned to the channel here. You guys know that I'll keep you plugged in, uh, keep you locked in with everything that's going, whether that's going to be on another live show, whether that's a standalone video. And we'll see on Sunday, maybe another week where I push off until Monday um, to, to get you the live video, depending on the NCAA tournament games and how that is going. Because look, I just showed you, like we've got a record number of people watching the tournament games. I, I know where everybody is at. I don't want to pull you away from tournament games for the shows. So stay tuned for that. Follow me on Twitter at, uh, at JL Kurtz. If you want the latest updates on that and uh, scheduling as we move forward. So as always spread the word, tell your friends and family, word of mouth, social media, Twitter, Instagram, X threads, wherever it is that you're on social media, spread the word about the channel, uh, like the video on your way out the door. And uh, I will talk to you all soon. Thanks for being here tonight.